The apostle says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of Jesus' calling in your life, right? That what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the workings of the strength of his might. How strong do you think Jesus is? And then Paul, as he says that in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 6, he says, finally, he speaks about the power of Jesus. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Father, we thank you for this morning. Good morning, Lord God Almighty. Lord, we have awoken to a beautiful day today, a day that you've made. We're thankful for life today. Lord, we're thankful for every breath that we breathe of this air that you made. The gift of life that we have, we're grateful to you for, Lord God Almighty. And as we gather in this place, we gather with purpose. We come to worship God in spirit and truth. We come to sit at the feet of the Lord Jesus and pray for his spirit to fall upon us and to teach us. We ask, Lord, that you would open our eyes, that we would indeed be enlightened to so many spiritual truths that, that have incredible impact in our lives and how we live each day. So, Lord, we, we welcome to you this second Sunday of 2024. We thank you, God, what you're about to do in this place. We love you, we trust you, we declare you're a good God. We pray this in the name of Jesus, and all those who love Jesus would say amen, amen and good morning. It's good to be with you, and you all may be seated. Uh, and so here's, here's the sadness. Um, I don't, how many people have relatives that's on the East Coast or the Midwest? Because I do. The Winans live in uh, New Jersey. I have had zero th- sympathy from my relatives on the East Coast. I told them it's really cold here in California. <laughs> And isn't it, though? Is it cold? It's cold. Uh, But try to tell that to your relatives or your friends that live in the Midwest or the East Coast, and they will have choice words for you. Um, So, hey, but here's the deal, man. Welcome. It's the second Sunday of 2024. Are Are you getting used to writing that? 2024. So, a person in the church told me two weeks ago, they said, Pastor Frank... I thought 2023 started uh, as a mess with the war in Ukraine and just the heaviness of seeing the suffering that's happening in in Europe and a war unfolding in in Europe for the first time since World War II, right? And they, they said, I thought 2023 started off bad, and now it's 2024, and now we have a, a war in, in the Middle East, and it's an election year. Do you guys remember the last election year? You, th- Pastor Frank, this, war, th- this year is going to be even more a mess. Here's the deal. This is going to be a great year, people, because God is in this year. The Lord is totally in control. This is a year for us to draw near the Lord, to be strong and to be courageous. Why? Because God is with you. And the, if the Lord is for you, who can be against you? Amen? This is a year for us to draw close to Jesus. And if there's ever a year to put on God's preparation for your life, you can't predict the future and neither can I, but we can prepare for it. Yeah, I there's some good chance that we're going to see some storms on the horizon this year. And I'm not just talking about cold weather and Arctic, you know. There's going to be some storms this year. We can, we can kind of see that coming. Let's prepare for it. And so what we're going to do here in this next series is we're going to be talking about the armor of God and, and putting on, praying on God's armor. 
So it's gonna be, people, this is gonna be a good year, but this is a year, if there's ever a year where we probably need to prepare for this year, it's this year. And that's my goal as your pastor. My goal this year is to prepare you for this. And the best way I can think of what God's been speaking into me is just remembering once again this incredible teaching that we're gonna find in the book of Ephesians. But before I go there, I just wanna say this. Our vision for this year, right now as we speak, our youth is at youth camp. Our youth is at youth camp as we speak. Wasn't it cool last Sunday to see them doing the welcome and announcements and the prayer? Our vision for this year, one thing that we just really sense God speaking to us is we, one generation, needs to speak into the next generation. As we're running this faith, as we're running the good uh, race of faith, there's a whole new generation that's coming up, and they need to learn how to run this race of faith. And (laughs) do you think this next generation's got a tough run at it? Man, the world that you and I grew up in is completely different than the one that they're being raised in. Uh, And for these young warriors, these amazing people, our goal this year is just to pour into them. And so, you know, right now, I just my heart and prayer has been for those up at camp, um, just being intentional and mentoring the next generation. For Pastor Frank, I'm, I'm focusing specifically on just on the college career group, young marrieds in our church, just wanna speak into them from one generation to the next. This is what we're gonna be doing. We, we've, we've got some great, um, I, hey, did you know that ministry just comes out of relationships with people? My, my desire is just to meet, I, I, I told our college career people last Sunday, I just wanna know you. I wanna hear your story and I want you to hear mine. And I told them straight up, I'm just gonna be completely open and honest with you. You guys can ask me any question. My life is on my sleeve. This is my journey and, and just learning how to um, speak into people's lives because they know that you care for them. And, and, and just, it's mentoring. Hey, who prays for you? Who encourages you in Jesus? Do you have anybody in your life that prays for you? Do you have anybody in your life that encourages you in Jesus? Starting this week, we're restarting and relaunching our small groups at our church. We call them growth groups because we're all on the journey to grow. That's a part of being an adult, right? To grow spiritually. And so this... People, there's a, we're launching this, we're, we're gonna start now, and we go till the, the uh, Saturday right before Good Friday. We're encouraging people to get into a small group. Why would I do that, Pastor Frank? I'm busy, I know you are. But there's something about coming and hearing the word of God on a Sunday morning, and then sometime in the midweek, a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday, a Friday, a Saturday, you name it, to, to, to get together at someone's house, it, uh, even here at the church, Friday night groups, to, to gather again and to, with each other, stir in the sermon, reread the scriptures, and share and talk about, hey, you know, this is how this applies to me, and this is what I was going through. You begin sharpening each other in relationships. In these small groups is where people begin praying for each other. They begin sharing their life together. This is where they're encouraging each other. This is when life happens and praying for people. We're, we're relaunching small groups. If you are not in a group, man, ask, tell us. I want to be in one. Tell us what, what day would be the best and what you're looking for, right? Contact the office and let us know because this is what ministry is. It's relationships. Discipleship or, or spiritual growth happens in relationships with other people. And that's, this is, here we go, man. We're, our, our, we're gonna be real intentional in trying to build relationships and, and mentor the next generation. And for all of us in this room, hey, you, you need each other to pray with each other and encourage one another and, 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 and live life together. If you're not in a group, you need to be in one. As your pastor, I'm begging you, please join one. You need this. And those people in that group need you. Just encouraging you. So that's where we're heading, where we're growing, and welcome to 2024. So here's the deal. This is a really intimidating book. 66 books written over 1,600 years on three different continents in three different languages, written by kingdom, uh, by kings and shepherds. It's an incredible thing. And yet there's one message through the whole thing, 
One central theme all the way through from Genesis through Revelation. How can that be? Because there's only one author. In the New Testament, there's an incredible book, a foundational book. It's called the book of Ephesians, written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, this book is, is, is incredibly foundational to the Christian faith. It's a book personally that radically transformed my life as a young Christian, understanding who I am as a child of God and, and how God sees me in heaven through Christ. It was it's just an incredibly transformational book. It was written by the Apostle Paul, who was a, uh, a hater of Jesus. The Apostle Paul, Rabbi Saul, uh, he was a, a Jewish Pharisee who fought against the church and one day had a radical conversion experience himself, and he becomes the greatest, like, um, uh, missionary of bringing Jesus to the Roman world. And as the Apostle Paul is sitting in a Roman prison, he writes to the church at Ephesus. And the information that he gives in this book is incredible. The, the, the journey of thought of the Apostle Paul as he's penning from a Roman prison to the church at Ephesus is just awesome. It's incredible. In Ephesians chapter one, he speaks about our identity in Christ and who we are in the eyes of Jesus. Uh, he speaks about how God sees us because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. He speaks about um, that we're holy and blameless in, in, in the eyes of heaven because of the work of Jesus. He speaks about us being adopted as his children. See, when you read Ephesians 1, and just notice all the times it says, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in him, in the beloved, in Christ, in Christ, he begins telling you who we are. Being a Christian is not only receiving something, it's becoming somebody. This is radical. It's transformational in our lives. It's not just I, I've received something, I've become someone. Did you know that God doesn't need any bankers in heaven? Did you know that God doesn't need a lawyer in heaven or a cop or a doctor there is no more sickness or suffering in heaven. God, what, what, what is filled in heaven is, is family. The scripture says that we are an adopted child of God. To stir that in your brain is awesome. To realize who you are because of Christ's work upon your life is so transformational. This is who I am. This is who I will eternally always be. And as Paul is teaching this in Ephesians 1, it's like he pauses in the teaching and he starts praying for you. Praying these words. I pray in verse 18 and 19, Paul, as he's teaching this radical theological truth, he says, he, he just says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know it is the hope of his calling, do you? What are the riches of the glory of the inheritance that, that you have as a child of God? What is the surpassing greatness of his power that's in your life? The strength of his might, he prays for you. So take notes of me this morning. Stir this in because as we're gonna talk about the armor of God, it wasn't written in a vacuum. There's a whole journey in the epistle. Write this down. In Ephesians 1, Paul prays that we understand Christ's power given to us. To understand Christ's power given to us. How are you in that journey? Have, have you really comprehended Christ's power that's been given to you in the cross and the resurrection, the salvation that you have, the adoption that you have, the eternal family that you're a part of? Where are you on that journey? Because for us to stir that in, he prays that you get this. Do you get it? It's transformational. That's Ephesians 1. In Ephesians 2, Paul says, now let me tell you who you were before you knew Jesus and, and how you got to who you are, right? And then Paul in the third chapter starts talking about the mystery that 
when the, when the Jewish Messiah comes, he just doesn't save Jews, but he also saves you, a non-Jew. How many people in here are non-Jewish? Raise your hand. The Apostle Paul was shocked that the blood of Jesus fell upon a Gentile's life too, that, that Jesus isn't just for the Jewish people, that his blood covers all mankind, which is not surprising when we read in Genesis, God promises that from the seed of Abraham, all the nations will be blessed. And yet, Revelation hadn't been written yet, but we read in the book of Revelation that the angels in heaven are singing that the blood of Messiah washes away people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. We are one people. And Paul says this, Jesus is creating one new humanity. The book of Ephesians is awesome. One new humanity in Christ. It's a, it's, it's a beautiful journey in the teachings. In Ephesians 4 and 5, Paul says, because all this is true, this is how you're to live your life, right? Um, calling out how we're to live our lives, in our family relationships, in our marriages, in our workplace, with our employer and our employee. And it's, it's always in an epistle. There's theological truth and there's practical application. And you can read Ephesians. Read it, people. It's so beautiful. And most people said, man, if Paul had it stopped in Ephesians 5, it would have been an amazing epistle. But then he goes back to teaching again. As he's ending, he says, ah, oh, but let me teach you one more thing. And he begins writing down these words. In Ephesians 6.10, ah, the end of my epistle, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Finally, Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Whose strength are we talking about? His, right? How many people have New Year's resolutions? I do. Anyone have New Year's resolutions? How many people want to be more healthy this year? Raise your hand. You're planning on maybe eating better, going to the gym, right? How many people in here are your New Year's resolution? I want to grow. I want to intellectually. You're going to read more. You're going to watch less YouTube or television. Great. You know, all our New Year's resolutions is based upon us. We're going to do better. We're going to achieve more. I'm going to do this. What Paul is speaking about here is not your strength. What Paul is speaking about here is the strength of somebody else in your life. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, in, of his might. In Ephesians 2, take notes with me this morning, right? Here's our second note, and this is so important. In Ephesians 6, Paul commands us to apply Christ's power to our life. He prays that we would understand the power of Jesus in our life and who we are as a child of God. And then he prays that we would apply the power of Christ to our life. He commands us to apply the power of Christ to our life. Well, how are we to do that? He, Paul gives us this analogy of a Roman soldier and Roman armor and how to put on all these different pieces. And we're going to be talking about this this in this next season of teaching here at the church, putting on the armor of God. Why? Why is this so important? Next verse. Ephesians 6, 10 and 11. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So this isn't your New Year's resolutions. This is you just, I'm... You just need to stir in the power of Christ in your life. This is God's power. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may stand, be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. See, for us to be successful in 2024, we need to understand the power of Christ in us and apply the power of Christ in us. Because, people, we live in a universe where physical and spiritual realms interact. Note number three this morning, write this down. The Bible teaches that we live in a universe where physical and spiritual realms interact. For us in the Western world, this is a radical stretch. For those of us that come from India in this room, that come from uh, Africa in this room, the spiritual realm and the physical realm are not as much 
a concept for us to try to understand. People, the scriptures are clear on this from the book of Genesis through the book of Revelation that there's a physical realm and a spiritual realm that interact with each other. And the spiritual realm affects the physical realm. And the physical realm affects the spiritual realm. It's in the scriptures, from Genesis through Revelation. You are a being that is both physical and spiritual. You are a being created that is both material and non-material. To be absent from the body is to be in Christ, that's a part of your inheritance. Heaven, purchased. Your spirit, to be absent from your body is to be present with the Lord in Christ. You are a material and non-material being. It's so, if you ever unpack, The Bible says that there's the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. In the kingdom of darkness, there's an angelic being that was called Lucifer. And he's he's a created being, a powerful angel who rebelled against heaven and took a third of of God's angels with him. They're now called demons. FYI, if you do the math, that means there's three-fourths that are, you know, one-third, right? Uh, Christ, this realm hates you. This realm wars against the saints of God. There's a great theologian named William Grinnell that says, it is the image of God reflected in you that so enrages hell. It is at this at which the demons hurl their mightiest weapons. If God loves, if your enemy loves something so much, wouldn't you wanna take that away from you in order just to hurt you? Do you realize You know what Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter three? At one point, Paul has another prayer for you. He says, I pray that you would understand the height, the depth, the width of God's love that's given into you. I pray that you would understand the love that God has for you. God loves you. His enemies hate you and scheme against you. Scheme against you. Should this scare us? 1 John chapter four, verse four says this, you dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than one, the one who's in the world. Greater is the one that's in you than the one who's in the world. Does that comfort you? It comforts me. Should we be afraid of this? No. See, here's the deal, people. Our victory is already won. The war is over. It was finished on the cross. See, we're not fighting for victory, we're fighting from victory. I wanna say that again. Jesus said it is finished. We're not fighting for victory, we're fighting from victory. Christ has already won. Christ has already won. The battles that are fought now are just mop-up operations. They're more, into the macro and the micro, there's, there's battles to be fought, but the war is already won. And because this is true, Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. You need to understand the power of Jesus and apply it in your life because all the resources of a child of God is needed, is drawn from Christ and his mighty power. Everything you need to be successful in 2024 is drawn from Christ. It's drawn from Jesus See, there is a spiritual enemy of your soul out there, and he's from another realm. And according to Jesus, he comes to steal and kill and destroy you, John 10. And we need to understand this, and so as to stand against it. He schemes against you. You didn't think that you were that important, that he would scheme against you, but you are. He schemes against you. I didn't know I was that important. Well, you are. Just look at the cross. Just look what Jesus did for you. You're actually important in the eyes of heaven. And there's an enemy of your soul that schemes against you. And Jesus speaks about him. I'm a natural man. My spiritual journey comes from atheism. I don't believe in the spiritual realm. 
Did you know that you evolved over billions of years of time and chance? Through Darwinian evolutionary theory, right? Did you know that life evolves from non-life, right? Did you know, intelligence evolves from non-intelligence, right? Chaos evolves, order, it comes out of chaos, right? Read Jesus. As a skeptic, I began reading Jesus in my early 20s because you Christians were witnessing to me. And as a skeptic, I began reading Jesus. Where in here is Jesus? It's the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Four portraits of Christ. I began reading Jesus. Hey, when you begin reading, do you know what Jesus began his ministry? He went into the wilderness of temptation and fought Satan for 40 days and 40 nights. Weird, anyone? Weird, anyone? Weird to me. What? Put it on a shelf. You begin reading Jesus. He's casting demons. Re- demons, I don't believe in that. This is cr- but I like Jesus. It's my spiritual journey of trying to figure out Is there a creator? Does my origins come from nothing or from something? Am I creating the image of God or am I just a product of billions of years of time and chance? It's the journey. We all are on a journey, right? On my spiritual, as I began, people, when Jesus begins fulfilling prophecies, when Jesus is the prophesied one, Merry Christmas, Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, Isaiah 53, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 14. I mean, he is the Messiah. It's the miracle of the Bible. He's totally real. Once you begin believing that Jesus died on a cross and came up out of the grave, your whole paradigm of how you view life shifts. Shifts. But all of a sudden, I begin looking at, looking at stuff again that I didn't believe in. Maybe it's true. Ha, ah, I became a believer in September of 1985 and 1988, I'm going full turkey into this thing. If somebody rose from the dead, you should probably listen to them because they might be smarter than you. Do I hear an amen? amen? All of a sudden, my whole world's changing. I find myself at a college called Biola University. I met this really cute girl, the most beautiful woman at Biola University, was telling me that she's going on a missions trip to the Dominican Republic to go work at an orphanage there, and I should go. Guess what I did? I'm not stupid. (laughs) I went, and we worked on an orphanage. And we were, um, it was so awesome, man. We worked at a leper colony. We went to the prisons, was preaching Christ. It was such a cool experience for my young faith to be with a bunch of college students from Biola, and, and just going and serving. It was so incredible. And then we were driving back to Santo Domingo to fly out on Good Friday. And we were in these vans. And it was the first time my professor, we were driving in these vans heading back on a dirt road. And there was a group of people sitting. There was a mass of people that was blocking the road. And and I'm watching this going, huh? And I go, Brother Mike, what's that? Dr. Michael Anthony, you guys remember him? He doesn't say anything to me. My friend Kim Swanson comes up, she wants to take a picture, and he screams at her, no pictures, freaking me out. We get closer to this mob, to where they're slowing, and he was so intentional, we're just going right back to another, and they have machetes, and they're smacking the sides of our bus. And there, you could, it was quiet. And I never, I'll never forget this, as long as I live, ever. I looked out the window at this guy, and he looked at me. His eye was completely black. There was no white in it at all. And I looked at this human being, and I blurted out to everybody in the bus, there's Satan. You could feel a spiritual realm of darkness. And as we're in this, 
all, everybody in the bus was praying. I didn't, I, I, and I, all of a sudden, I'm like, back in my, I'm like, Lord, get us out of here, Lord, get us out of here, Lord, I, I, right? We, we bust through this thing. They were voodoo worshipers that were out celebrating that Jesus is dead, that he's gone, and in their cultic religious practices, they're whipping themselves into a transcendental state It was weird. It was my first experience of another dimension in another realm. I was just talking about this. We, uh, years later, we went to Haiti. That's the other half of the island. I went there with some people from this church. We were digging a freshwater well in the city of Hench. And as we traveled to the DR, what a a really hurting country. We were in this compound, and at nighttime, you could hear dogs screaming howling, but it didn't sound right. And the Christians that were in the compound with us, I'm like, what is that? He goes, those are people. Those are people. Those sounds are not, a, those are people, Pastor Frank. Those are voodoo worshipers. And they're surrounding this encampment because they know that you Christians are here. Let me be weird. How many of you in this room has ever experienced some form of an evil spiritual experience? Demonic dreams, visions, voices. Keep your hands up. I'm just real interesting. Demonic thoughts. How many people in this room has ever experienced this before? Let me say it again. A spiritual evil experience. A demonic dreams. You woke up with night terrors but something was in your presence of your room. Visions or voices, manifestations. How many of you? I hope you never do. But for you to be geared up for success in 2024, it's important to understand that we live in a universe, that the kingdom of darkness is at work in this world. There's an enemy of your soul in this world. And for you to know this is important. It's important. It's real. This, this doesn't happen to me. I don't experience, there is not, there is not a, a demon under every rock. This doesn't happen to me every day, but in my spiritual journey, I've experienced this seven or eight times. Talbot Theological Seminary, I'm taking a class, Dr. Neil Anderson. There's about 80 of us in this class. Future Pastors of America, we're taking a class called uh, Spiritual Conflicts and Biblical Counseling. And, and you guys remember college? Remember your first day of college? You always have your, uh, you, 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 you have a syllabus and your professor's there and he's talking about how this class is gonna go and this is how it's gonna be. Dr. Anderson was doing that. And in the middle of his class, He asked the class, he said, how many of you were plagued with bad dreams the last couple of nights? And I'm sitting in the front row, right there, and I'm like, looking at him. Like, that's a stupid question. What professor would ask this? And as I peel over my left shoulder, 80% of my classmates have their hand up with a shocked look on their face, Like, how did you know? And it was so, it was slow motion because as they were like looking at him and going, how did you know? They were shocked and they were looking at each other going, you too. I didn't get it. But I'm looking at this and I look back at my professor at Talbot Theological Seminary and he informs us. He says, the material that we're gonna be teaching you in the next semester is really important to you, and there's actually a spiritual force that does not want you to learn this, and is already against you in trying to, taking this class and what you're about to be taught. Just because you don't experience something doesn't mean it's not true. It's important for you to understand that the universe that we live in is both physical and spiritual. And the spiritual affects the physical and the physical affects the spiritual. 
And it works that way. It's all through the scriptures. There's a kingdom of darkness and a kingdom of light. There's actually an enemy of your soul. And he schemes against you, wanting to steal and kill and destroy you. This is true. This is true. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 and 11. Wow, here's the journey of the end of this epistle. It's beautiful. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Take notes with me this morning. This is just for you to ponder in your own life. The Bible teaches that the devil schemes on how to destroy your life. That's why you need to learn to fight in this realm. That's why we're going to be teaching this. How do you think the devil attacks you? There's an incredible teaching of Jesus. Early in his ministry in John chapter eight, the the miracle man is doing incredible things along the Sea of Galilee, the, the, the miracle man from Galilee, and he's in Jerusalem, and the religious leaders are going at him, and they were going back and forth. And it's actually kind of an intense teaching. They, they call him an illegitimate son. They attack him personally, and they begin talking about his origins. He says, I'm from God the Father, and you're of your father as well. And they're like, we're of Father Abraham. He goes, no, man, you're of your father the devil. That would be insulting, wouldn't it? If someone told you that your dad's the devil, would you be insulted? They had insulted him. You remember Mary and Joseph and the virgin birth? Well, they, did you know that in politics, sometimes they dig up, they, they try to dig up the dirt on your background and try to get at you with it? Did you know that they do that in politics? <laughs> they were doing it to Jesus. They called him an illegitimate son. Read, read John 8. And he says, hey man, I'm, I'm of my father in heaven and you're of your father. And Jesus says this. In John 8, 44, you're of your father, the devil. And, you will, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. Sounds like Jesus has pre-knowledge of this guy, doesn't it? He does not stand in truth because there's no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he's a liar and the father of lies. Here's a note for you to understand. Write this one down. Note number five. The schemes of Satan for our lives is always rooted in deception and lies. Do you know how, how powerful a lie can be in your life? If you would, if, I remember, if Satan can get you to believe a lie, Frank, he could control your life. Is that true? Deception. He's called the deceiver of the brethren. The, the, the deceiver of the nations. If Satan could, could, de- could deceive the world, could he control it? This is how he attacks us. And, and, and let me say this. Let's give him credit. He's really, really good at it. The scripture says he appears as an angel of light. Uh, he makes bad things look good. And he makes good things look bad. He's really good at lying. He's really good at it. And Jesus says, you will know the truth, people, and the truth will set you free. What is the opposite of freedom? Slavery. Slavery. Jesus says, he speaks, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If the truth sets you free, what does lies bring into your life? Slavery. Look around. Bondage. Look around. Deception. Professor Winans. Satan's been really attacking me. Really. Yeah, my grades are terrible. I got I got some hard news for you, son. 
The reason why your grades are so bad is because you're terrible as a student. If you would just do your homework and turn in your assignments, you'd have a better grade. Satan is not under every rock. Some people are obsessed with this. You are not to be obsessed with it. And you don't blame him for everything in your life. Have you ever heard of this thing called cause and effect? Has anyone heard this before? You, you, you throw a, maybe a tennis ball at a wall, and that's the cause and effect. It comes back at you. The, uh, Paul speaks about this. He, he calls it, you reap what you sow. Has anyone heard this before? If you plant stupidity, you'll reap stupidity. If you go to college and you don't open your textbook, and you don't do the work, guess what's, that's the cause, guess what the effect is? Bad grades, and you don't blame that on Satan. People, life is difficult, but life is more difficult when you're stupid. Do I hear an amen? Some of this is just because you did it to you. You don't blame him for it. That's just a part of you growing up and being a, a, a mature adult to learn from your mistakes and grow up. That's a part of just being an adult. That is not what Paul is speaking about here in Ephesians 6. He says that there is actually another realm that actually schemes to destroy you. It's completely different than this. And for you to not be obsessed with this, but to at least realize it's there. And to be wise, it's, isn't this beautiful? People, we're gonna talk about, it's funny, Paul prays, I pray that your eyes would be enlightened, that you would know who Christ is, and that you would apply the power of Christ in your life. Why? Because there is realms happening that you don't completely understand, but you need to under, enter in and put on the arm of God. You know what the first piece of, it's truth. Jesus will speak and we're gonna unpack this. Next week, we're talking about the truth. Christ imparts truth into your life. And for you to apply truth is critical for your victory. Is somebody lying to you? Have you been listening to the lies of the enemy? Because if, if that's happening, your life is just in bondage and slavery and addictions. Darkness, prison. Jesus says, I come to set the captives free. Amen. Here it is, you ready? Ephesians chapter six. Here's just 10 through 13. Finally, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. His might. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. How many people have noticed there's darkness in the world? You guys see that? You know it's not just humanity doing that? There's actually somebody pulling the strings like a puppet? Therefore, Paul says, therefore, since this is a reality, since we live in a universe where there is more than one realm and the spiritual realm is fighting against us in the physical realm, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Take up the whole armor of God. Well, which part? All of it. We should put it all on. Which one's most important, Pastor Frank? All of them. All seven parts of this that we'll be speaking about is critical for your life. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. You're going to, the, applying the power of Jesus in your life is to apply truth, is to apply righteousness, peace, shoes of peace, shields of faith, helmets of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and prayer. In the spirit is where the battles are fought in prayer. 
He says, you do all this that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. We are to withstand and to take our stand. We, it's like we withstand and we take our stand. You ever been driven by the wind? Has the wind ever hit you really hard? You ever been in a windstorm and it hits you and you just kind of lean back into it? You withstand. You know what I'm saying? You withstand. It's, it's so beautiful. You withstand and you stand. To withstand evil in your life. To fight in your innermost being. To withstand temptation. Man, Hey, people, if there's anything in your life that Satan loves and God hates, get it out. And if we journey in this series, if God begins revealing stuff in your life that shouldn't be there, get it out. You withstand and you take your stand. You hold true. You put on the armor of God. This is how you're victorious. You guys, hey, Pastor Frank, I don't think 2024 is going to be a very good year. It's going to be an amazing year because God is with us this year. And we can't totally predict the future, but we can prepare for the future. Hey, you know, the best way to prepare for the future is to pray on the armor of God, to understand the power of Jesus in your life and to apply the power of Jesus in your life. Truth is really important in your life. Righteousness is really important in your life. Peace that Jesus brings you, really important in your life. Faith. Salvation, the word of God, prayer. Dr. Martin Luther King's, we're, we're celebrating his on tomorrow, right? It's a day off. That's why our students are up at camp this week. Before, God bless Dr. Martin Luther King. Did you know there was another guy named Martin Luther? You ever heard of him? He was a Catholic priest who lived in the 16th century. If you ever hear his story, and he talks about his story, he was in a monastery, a student, theologian, Martin Luther. And he would be tormented at night in dreams, and so loud that he would be, you could hear him like screaming in his, in his bedroom. And he would talk about how Satan would visit him in his dreams. And he would show him this huge scroll of all of the sins that this man has done. All of the the accuser of the brethren. You know what Satan actually means? Accuser. He's the accuser of the brethren. And as Martin Luther would talk about this, he said that he would be tormented in these dreams at night. It's almost like the kingdom of darkness was really afraid of this guy. Like God was going to do something through this man. Martin Luther would talk about this and how he was tormented in his dreams at night and this demonic powers would visit him and tell him how unworthy he is and what a sick individual he is and how disgusting of a human being he is and unfolding all of the sins in his life and as he would fight in this realm as he was almost afraid to go to bed at night and he said one day in his dreams he began fighting back He said, show me the end of the scroll. Show me the end of the scroll. Show me the end of the scroll. And at the end of the scroll, it said, paid in full, Jesus Christ. Do I hear an amen? That's the truth. You fight in this realm to apply the power of Christ in your life. To know who you are as a child of God. May the eyes of your of your life be enlightened, your mind, that you may understand the riches of his calling, the inheritance he has for you, how God sees you in Jesus, to understand the power of Christ and what this means. It's transformational. And then you begin to apply it upon your life. That's what Paul's speaking about, man. You need to wrap on the power of Jesus to withstand in the evil day. It's absolutely important. Last truth, last point. Write this down. Note number six, and we're done. The armor of God is applying Christ's power in your life. The armor of God is applying the power of Christ in your life. To understand the power of Christ, well, how do, how do I apply that? Well, let me just walk you through it. Does it make sense? Next week, truth. Righteousness. Peace. Salvation. Faith. 
You, you put this stuff on? I was praying with a brother this week. He says, Pastor Frank, I am praying this in my life. Going through a really dark time in his life. Hey, brother, how you doing today? Pastor Frank, I'm praying the armor of God today because I know it's gonna be a bad day. It's gonna be a good year, people. We can't totally predict the future, but we can prepare for it. And that's what we're gonna do. So don't miss next week. Father in heaven, we love you and praise you and thank you, God. Jesus, you are real and alive. You are awesome and mighty and powerful. You're the one that breaks chains and heals bodies. You're the one that sets people free. Jesus, you're the one that said that you go to prepare a place for us in heaven. And you come for us in your own good time. And we will always be with you. Thank you, Jesus, that because of your blood, that we've been adopted as children of the living God, washed, anointed, blessed, healed, forgiven, redeemed, justified, sanctified. We are a new humanity in Christ. Send your spirit upon us, Jesus. Help us to understand these things. And sovereign God, if you choose to move upon this place, then you, your will be done. For you know the heart of all people in this room. And God, you understand what all of us are dealing with today. We draw near to you. And we know that you draw near to us. For there is no name except the name of Jesus.